Hi, everybody. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join our conference today. Hopefully, it'll be an interactive case presentation for everybody. So please join on to poll EV, and we'll be using that throughout our case to get some answers from you guys. So let's get started. So today, our objectives that we'll be covering are A, to define a major injury to one of our vital organs, two, methodically identifying the cause of said injury, and then three, understanding a little bit of the UNOS distribution of this vital organ for transplantation. And there won't be a lot of mystery surrounding what organ this is, but um, let's see what we find. Just a reminder to log on to poll EV and the instructions will pop onto the questions as well. So like we did last week, we will again do um, echo review. And so this time I'm asking you to identify the right ventricle by placing a marker on it. Great. This time it looks like we have a little bit of discrepancy between where people think the right ventricle is. So this is good. We'll have a learning point. Um, and this is certainly a harder echo image to obtain and to read. Um, and so let's see what this is. So this is the sub xiphoid view. Um, and here we use the liver as a window to take a look at the heart. And so what chambers are we seeing here? So the right ventricle is actually this chamber that many of you identified correctly. Here is the left ventricle. Here's the right atrium dumping into the right ventricle. And then this, which many of you thought may have been the right ventricle, is actually a pericardial effusion. And so if you think about the way we're looking into this patient, here's their skin um, near their sternum, the xiphoid process. And so we're actually looking up at the heart. And so as you can imagine, this area is actually the dependent area of the body. And so in this view, very commonly, the pericardial effusion will localize to the dependent portion of the pericardium um, closest to the liver. And then some of this here are also the pericardium, the shiny areas. Um, what else do I have here? The liver, as I said the interventricular septum, and here's your sub xiphoid view. Try and get this the next time you're echoing a patient and see what chambers you can identify. Great, so moving on to our case, we have a 24-year-old woman who's evaluated in the emergency department for confusion, a pretty common complaint um, presented to us, and so let's hear a little bit more about her. I'm not gonna go very deeply into her history, but just some of the pertinence. So she gave birth 11 weeks ago to a healthy baby. She was started on sertraline a couple of weeks ago for postpartum depression. And then she's taking ongoing iron supplementation for anemia of her pregnancy. And so very often when a patient's presented with confusion, uh, for me, it's like, is the patient confused or am I confused? Because there's a lot going on. And so we'll work through some of this. Just a plug for our internal medicine YouTube channel. Um, we have been uploading all of our present, most of our presentations to it. And if you need a refresher on altered mental status or confusion, Ben did a great base camp lecture on it. So you can always go there to review that lecture. But in the meantime, I'll give you an exam and then we'll go through some questions. So for her vital signs, she's afebrile, she's tacky, lowish blood pressure, uh, but it would be helpful to know her baseline because in young women, pressures of uh, 90s over 60s are not uncommon and she's setting 98% on room air. She appears fatigued, her BMI is uh, no, normal. She has scleral icterus. She's tachycardic about, as above, but she doesn't have any signs of volume overload. Um, her lungs are clear. She has some mild epigastric tenderness, but negative Murphy's. She's jaundiced, but no telangiectasias. 
She's slow to answer questions, but she doesn't have asterisks, but she cannot remember the day or month. So oriented limitedly. So given that information, um, her confusion and then that exam, what tests do you want to see next? And if you could briefly tell me why with separated by a comma, that would be helpful for us to see some clinical reasoning. LFTs and CBCs. Mm -hmm. Great. A confused person with jaundice and scleral icterus. Great. So you guys are getting at the two most uh, common causes of jaundice, which are usually liver injury and sometimes hemolysis. Fibro quadrant ultrasound. Good, I assume to look at the liver parenchyma and perhaps the vasculature around there, maybe the biliary tract system. Great. I agree with most of these. And so let's see where we go next. So um, a lot of the labs that you guys I, um, asked for are here, not everything, uh, but you will get some more of those later. So on a CMP, you see that she has a creatinine of 1.3, which is slightly elevated from her baseline. She has um, AST and ALT elevations. Um, she has a bilirubin of 11.9, most of which is direct. Um, and she has uh, an INR of 1.9, a little bit of a low albumin, and then an anemia. So a lot of you got at these um, numbers with your clinical reasoning earlier. Okay, so given this information, which diagnosis are you most worried this patient may have? Okay, so just for everybody that may have joined late, we're talking about a 24-year-old woman who gave birth 11 weeks ago, um, who is presenting with confusion, on exam is jaundiced, and on labs has EST, ALT elevation, bilirubin elevation, and anemia. And so here we have uh, quite a range of um, answers. And so let's go through these. Um, I'll tell you that the um, correct answer is acute liver failure. Um, and we will talk about why it wasn't acute liver injury or HELP syndrome, but before that, let's answer this question. Okay, so majority of you are correct. ALT does not need to be greater, greater than 500 for acute liver failure. So let's look at what defines acute liver failure in our patients. So the definition of acute liver failure includes an INR of greater than or equal to 1.5. The patient has to have neurological dysfunction, which is essentially hepatic encephalopathy, also known as confusion in lay people terms. Um, no evidence of prior liver disease, and most namely, this means cirrhosis, and then disease onset or course of less than 26 weeks. So this must be an acute or a subacute presentation, 
Um, this can't be ongoing for longer than that. Um, the 26 weeks ha is different depending on the literature you look at. Some people say 24 weeks, some people say much shorter than that. But this is the definition of acute liver failure. And so as you guys can see, nowhere in that definition do we see AST, ALT, platelets, bilirubin, albumin. So I want you guys to forget about these and sort of put these out of your head. Um, and just focus on the patient's clinical presentation and focusing on the patient's INR and some of those other things we talked about. And so, um, as you can see then for our patient who is presenting with confusion, so she has encephalopathy, she is presenting with an INR of 1.9. Um, this is an acute injury. Um, and I told you that she, I haven't told you her past medical history, but she didn't have um, history of liver injury prior to this. Um, and so she meets the criteria for acute liver failure. Now, why wasn't this acute liver injury? Simply because she meets criteria for acute liver failure. Had her INR been 1.2, then this woman would have acute liver injury because the area STALT are elevated from baseline. Um, she has some other signs of liver dysfunction. And then HELP syndrome certainly could be in our differential. She had a little bit of thrombocytopenia. She had some anemia. She has liver dysfunction, or she has liver dysfunction, and um, so HELP syndrome occurs typically later in pregnancy, in third trimester. It can occur post delivery, but 11 weeks post delivery is a little bit too far away from delivery date for HELP syndrome to occur. So that's why HELP syndrome wasn't the correct. Date. Okay. So then, um, I like to give you guys the patient rep patient representations, and then some of our other. Chiefs, Corey and Danny, Amelia, make you go through it, but I just want you to get used to seeing somebody give you a patient representation. And so here I have a 24 year old female presenting with new onset encephalopathy with evidence of acute liver failure complicated by hyperbilirubinemia and anemia. Okay. If at any point you guys have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, but today we'll use mostly cold EV to um, go through our case. So before we work up her liver failure, what questions can I answer or clarify for you? I know that in most of my presentations, I don't like to give a lot of past medical history, things like that, we stick to the pertinence. Was there a eutox? Yes, great question. Um, eutox was negative. Any meds at home? Yeah. Other than the sertraline that she is prescribed for postpartum depression, which she is taking as prescribed, and then um, the iron supplementation, she doesn't take any meds at home. Could you see ALF with normal LFTs? Yeah, sometimes you can. Um, if the patient has had an injury for a while, um, their hepatocytes could be burnt out. Um, AST and ALT are markers of cellular injury and they get spilled from the hepatocytes. So sometimes if all the hepat hepatocytes are dead, they may not be able to give you an elevation in AST and ALT. And so as long as you have uh, markers of liver failure, meaning confusion and INR greater than 1.5, you can have acute liver failure in that way. And then hepatitis exposures and prior medication use, great. Yeah, prior medications wise, I clarified that already. And if you guys asked about herbs and supplements, she says she doesn't take anything over the counter and nothing from friends or family. And then hepatitis exposures wise, um, you know, other than her recent pregnancy, which can sometimes cause people to be um, at a higher risk for hep E, she does not have any other hepatitis exposure. She's housed, no recent incarceration. Um, no recent diarrhea or anything like that. Great questions, guys. Okay, so let's work this up. Cool. So when I like to think of causes of acute liver failure, of course there are many, and when you go to up to date, you get this long list. There's going to be stuff that I haven't even included in here, and we, being internists, will focus on adults. Pediatric population has a few more causes of acute liver failure that we will not go into today. Um, and so let's walk through these. Um, for these symbols, I have um, bugs, so mostly viruses, 
We have the body itself, so anatomy and physiology. We have medications, which many of you mentioned. And then lastly, we'll have some toxins that we'll talk about. So let's go through this. So for bugs, um, mostly we're gonna look for these through labs. You guys mentioned hepatitis exposure. And so mostly here we have hepatitis A through E, could be any of them. Um, typically, um, hep B and C, depending on where you are in the infection, hep C tends to cause the least liver failure, but all of these can cause liver failure, and so you should check for most of them depending on a patient's um, risk factors. Um, typically, hep E we don't check for routinely in patient, nor hep D, unless the patient has hepatitis B. HIV. Um, and so you should, and I, the days that I'm writing here are days of presentation on which you should check these. So all hepatitis and HIV you should check on day one. And then as labs start to come back, then you can start thinking about, well, if it's not any of these, some of the other workup has been negative, what more should I think about? And so EBV, CMV, and the herpes viruses can also cause um, acute liver failure. And so you should be thinking about these on days two and three if you haven't found a cause. So having said that, how do we test for acute hepatitis infection? So I want you guys to type in the labs that you get. That's fair, and some of our hospitals, you can just type in acute hep panel and get the answer, but at some places, you'll have to know the specific individual test, so that's what I'm looking for. So hep B surface antigen, correct. Hep A IgM, correct. Mm -hmm. So there's um, no such thing really as hep C IgM. So you would just look for a hep C antibody and then a hep C RNA level. Great, so this is a great answer. So HBV surface antibody and antigen. Typically the antibody may not have formed yet if it's, if it's an acute infection, but certainly you want the HBV antigen. And then when you say, so a couple of people said hep B core antibody. I want to specify that's the hep B core IgM antibody. There are two, there's IgM and IgG. And for an acute infection, we're gonna look for a hep B core IgM. Okay, uh, Ehrlichia, I am not sure what that, you guys are referring to the parasite, but I don't think that was one I was thinking about. Good, but I think we covered it. And this answer, the HCV, hep B antigen, hep B IG, hep B antibody is fine. Hep B core IgM and then hep A IgM were the main answers. And then don't forget to order a hep C RNA. Good, good work. Uh, we will leave how to interpret hep B antibodies and antigens and envelope and all of that for a different time. I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen that chart where the lines go up and down for a hep B infection, and we can discuss that at a later point, but not today. Awesome. So, let me go back. So that was viruses. Next up, let's talk about anatomy and physiology. And so with this, you're typically going to use imaging to identify these causes of acute liver failure. And so what I have here is on day one, you're going to look for Bud Chiari. And some of you already wanted to write upper quadrant ultrasound at the beginning. Remember um, that imaging study. We're going to talk about some specifics in the question. Um, ischemic hepatitis on day one. Some of that is from history, right? Knowing that this patient has an episode of hypotension, they're grossly hypovolemic. Sometimes the AST, ALT trends can uh, tell you if this is ischemic hepatitis or not, but you should be thinking of that on day one. And then infl infiltration by tumor as well on day one um, for these patients. And then um, autoimmune causes um, are more day two or three, and I um, grouped that in here because I didn't have a great other place to put it. So for these things, um, what imaging studies should we get? 
I want you to be as specific as possible here. Great. So we want the ultrasound with Doppler because we're looking for blood flow. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What else can we get to look for, say, like tumor infiltration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. So a CT, so you can also get a CT scan, um, triple phase, which looks for uh, liver anomalies that also you can call radiology and always ask them to say, hey, I'm looking for by Chiari, this patient has acute liver failure. I kind of want to get a study that's going to show me the um, blood supply as well as the uh, parenchyma to look for tumor infiltration, and they can help you um, get that study the right way. But yeah, CT scan. Good. And then um, <clears throat> this question specifically asked for imaging study, but as you guys um, can see here, I also put autoimmune um, liver disease. And so just remember that there are specific antibodies we get for that, um, like anti-smooth muscle, um, liver kidney antibodies, um, and then uh, IgG subgroup. Um, think of those as well. But good job. Okay, so then going back, um, we're going to think about medications, which many of you already asked about. And so for medications, um, we'll talk a little bit about liver tox, but you're going to think of acetaminophen, obviously on day one, big cause of liver injury, liver failure. Um, we also usually get aspirin levels with it because a lot of patients come in with combined um, toxic, um, toxicity from aspirin and Tylenol. And then some of the ABG abnormalities that you may see in patients with acute liver failure may be manifesting due to aspirin toxicity. So make sure you just get both of those levels. Um, and then you're going to look up liver tox on day one with all of the medications that the patient is taking. Um, and so for ex all you do is you go to Google, you type in liver tox, and it'll bring you to this uh, MedHub page. I mean, so here I had sort of searched for sertraline since our patient is taking sertraline. Um, and it has been linked to rare instances of clinically apparent acute liver injury, not many cases, very rare of acute liver failure. So in this patient, we're going to say since she's taking it appropriately, unlikely to be a cause of um, acute liver failure. Okay. Last but not, not least, toxins. So again, you're gonna look for toxins with labs. And the ones that I have listed here are the one that everyone loves to talk about is our mushroom toxicity, uh, Amanita phalloides. Um, this is typically based on the history if the patient had any ingestion, if the friends or family know. Um, just know that this species is not a native to Colorado. So pretty unlikely that you will find that here. Um, and then we think about Wilson disease as well as hemochromatosis, both of which on days two and three, depending on if some of your higher um, likelihood tests are back positive versus negative. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about toxins. Uh, but before that, I'll give you guys our labs on day two. Some of these things that you guys had asked me for have come back. Um, her kidney injury is worsening. Her LFTs, um, liver enzymes are worsening, as is her bilirubin. Her INR is worse, so everything is getting worse. Um, and then you asked me for some hemolysis labs, and her rotic index is high, haptoglobin is low, and LDH is high, all of which with anemia is consistent with a hemo hemolytic process. And then for some of the day one labs, you see your Tylenol was negative, aspirin I didn't write here, also negative. Hep A IgM, negative. Hep B antigen, negative. Core antibody, which should be IgM, is negative. Hep C, negative. HIV, negative. Ultrasound with Dopplers, which you asked for, shows no evidence of blood carry, no lesions. Okay, so some of our day one stuff is coming back um, pretty reassuring. So now we're going to think of some of the day two and three stuff, um, and we're left with some toxin evaluation. And so I wanted to remind you that for hemochromatosis, typically depends on history. 
you check for a ferritin and a transferrin sat and remember in acutely ill patients, ferritin can be elevated, but for hemochromatosis, it's going to be off the charts, typically in the thousands. Um, and then again, for women, um, unlikely for them to get hemochromatosis until after menopause because due to men, um, menstruation, women typically have self um, loss of hemoglobin, and so their hemochromatosis typically onsets later than men. And so in her, it's unlikely. Um, but anyway, you checked a ferritin and it was fine. And so then we're left with Wilson disease. So I wanted to see, is cerebroplasmin high or low in patient with Wilson disease? Yeah, correct. This is a false statement. Think of ceruloplasmin as you think of haptoglobin. It's essentially a molecule slash enzyme that's whose job it is to sequester iron molecules from the blood and in Wilson disease, or, or sorry, copper molecules from the blood. And in Wilson disease, copper is elevated. And so ceruloplasmin is trying to eat up all that copper and those levels should be low in these patients. So for further discussion of this, um, we're looking for copper elevations in Wilson disease. And the first test that you'll get is a ceruloplasmin level, and you're looking for a low ceruloplasmin level. For a lot of these patients, it's also helpful to do a 24-hour urine collection for a copper level. And so as soon as you start thinking that this may be in your differential or getting higher in your differential, um, typically I just ask for the nurses to start a urine collection to see if we have that 24 hours. But typically, if patients present with acute liver failure with Wilson disease, they get sick pretty fast and you have to act. So let's see a little, a few caveats that occur with Wilson disease, which is what our patient has. Um, and so um, I just took this right from up to date. Just so you guys know, in patients who have acute liver failure, ceruloplasmin levels can be normal or elevated, so don't let that fool you. For a true diagnosis, you need a liver biopsy, but if you have a high enough suspicion for this disease, um, these patients typically need liver, emergent liver transplantation, and so you may not have time to wait for a biopsy. So how will we know that we don't have time to wait, this is Wilson's, and we better talk to hepatology fast um, and here are the reasons. So in patients that have acute liver failure who are under the age of 40, which our patient is, if they need any of the following criteria, then they uh, have a diagnosis of Wilson disease. So for our patient, we are already concerned for hemolytic anemia. Thank you, VATB. Neurologic symptoms prior to onset of acute liver failure, which we didn't talk about in this patient, but a lot of times these present as um, central nervous system problems, tremors, um, sometimes memory deficits, um, things like that. Kaiser Fleischer rings, as TB said, are rare. Um, and so typically you can look for them. Uh, some patients need a split lamp exam and so you can ask ophthalmology. Uh, but some of these other ones, Specifically, this ratio of AST to ALT greater than two, and then normal to subnormal ALKFAS, as well as this ratio of ALKFAS to bilirubin less than four, are pretty good giveaways that you may be dealing with Wilson disease. And in our labs, as you guys will see, this patient had all of those signs from the very beginning, where her bilirubin on admission was 11.9, but her ALKFAS was only like 29, and so that ratio is less than four. She also has this trend toward a two to one EST to ALT ratio. And she has evidence of anemia. And so from the beginning, uh, we should have had the suspicion that this is what may be going on in a young patient with acute liver failure. Okay, so on day three, um, we're getting some more labs and um, ongoing worsening of her um, liver injury. Um, and like I mentioned, 
see how her ability continues to climb, but her ALK loss has remained um, normal. Um, her AST ALT, which I made up, are two to one ratio. And then you end up getting a Coons because you saw this hemolytic anemia and that was negative uh, because these uh, red blood, cell, blood cells are lysing purely from um, copper toxicity. Um, and so this is why these patients not infrequently have hemolytic anemia. And then a ferritin was a little bit high, but she's acutely ill, so that's not uncommon. And her ceruloplasmin was 12. Typically, we're looking for a level less than 10, but remember, it could be falsely normal or elevated with acute liver failure, and so we're going to take some of these other signs and say we're quite worried about Wilson in this patient. And by now, um, often our hepatology colleagues like to know from the beginning when a patient comes in with acute liver failure, and they'll help you walk through some of these labs um, if you haven't thought about it already, but specifically at this juncture, if you haven't already, you should be consulting hepatology. Okay, so aside from consulting hepatology or making sure that they're on board, um, what other management strategies will we utilize? And the case today was largely focused on this diagnosis and workup of acute liver failure. Here's an opportunity if um, some of our seniors want to put in answers that may relate to um, treatment strategies as well. Collation. I did not look into this, and I'll be honest, I don't know much about this, um, though I worry that at this point, other than helping the anemia, it may not help the patient that much with her liver failing. Yep, list for transplant in case continues to work then. Mm -hmm. Awesome, great point. These patients are at risk for cerebral edema with acute um, HE. Um, these pa and I'll let you guys put in all your answers and then go on a little bit of a treatment tangent here. Excellent point. Mm -hmm. This is a, a point of contention. So typically in acute liver failure, while um, up to date and some of our other reference sites mentioned to check an acute ammonia level, a lot of the time um, you're going to base that on your exam and a patient's encephalopathy and an ammonia level uh, typically is unhelpful, whether high or low. And then an acute liver failure, actually, or rifaximin and lactulose don't tend to help with the encephalopathy. And so you need to reverse or treat their underlying condition. Acyclovir. Um, interesting point. If you guys are thinking of these at the beginning of a patient's admission, um, we uh, don't usually do prophylactic antivirals. Sometimes prophylactic antibiotics like Zosin are accepted, but you're going to be looking for signs of infection and you're going to be doing blood cultures in these patients because risk of infection is about 15% higher in patients who come in with acute liver failure. So we do tend to preemptively cover with antibacterials, but I'm not sure about antivirals. Penicillamine. Um, yeah, good thought. Again, I didn't look into this that deeply and I'm not sure is routinely standard of care. There's one other um, treatment option that I didn't see anybody mention here, which is N-acetylcysteine or NAC. You guys may be familiar with that in settings of acetaminophen related liver failure or acetaminophen toxicity where we use NAC, but there has been um, there have been some trials, uh, one in particular which demonstrated an overall mortality benefit to NAC regardless of the cause of acute liver failure. And so it is common practice to start patients on NAC because it's a very low risk medication on day one when somebody presents with liver failure, whether it's caused by acetaminophen or not. And that is something that hepatology recommends doing. So I would say that is one other thing that we should talk about. So um, just summarize, making sure that um, this patient's meds are appropriately dosed, 
And some of the other workup that we'll have to do is get a head CT uh, precisely to look for the cerebral edema. Make sure you get blood cultures and overall do a workup of infection. Um, and then sometimes if they are febrile, consider covering with Zosin to begin with. Um, and then chelation therapy, like I said, um, may not be very helpful at this stage for this patient, but could help with the anemia. Great. Okay, so we're listing this patient for transplant. And so let's talk about um, some transplant criteria. So there are these King's College criteria for transplant, both for acetaminophen related acute liver failure, as well as non acetaminophen causes. And so let's take a look into that. So for Tylenol, um, if a patient has a pH of less than 7.3, they're automatically listed for transplant as a status 1A, which is the patient that gets the first uh, liver available. Or they have to have all three of these things, high-grade encephalopathy, um, their INR is greater than 6.5, or their creatinine is greater than 3.4. And I just want to remind you that um, in these patients, you will often see pretty high INRs. Unless they're having active bleeding, um, you should refrain from reversing that INR for the sake of getting the number to look better because um, it does matter how high it is when they're listing people for transplant. And if you falsely lower it, it may reduce the patient's chances of getting a transplant, especially when it comes to non-acetaminophen causes, as we'll see here for this patient. Um, and so for this patient, if they're um, INR is greater than 6.5, they're automatically listed for transplant. Or depending on age, their etiology, Wilson's disease in this case, and then some of these other criteria, which our patient was headed toward with her worsening labs. So hepatology um, has listed her for transplant and she's getting pretty, pretty ill. And so let's take uh, just a few minutes to talk about um, how we determine transplants for liver. So prior to very recently, meaning January to February of this year, UNOS, which is the United Network of um, Organ Sharing, used to have these 11 regions in the country for liver transplant. Um, and what used to happen was somebody in our region, region A, needed a liver. And so you would look within that region for a donor for this person. And essentially what ended up happening was regions where there are um, higher populations, so region five, specifically California, and region nine, specifically New York, there were a lot more patients that needed organs, but not a appropriately high number of donors. And so there had been a lot of um, ethical discussions surrounding the fairness of this model. In 2018, we tried to change the model, which was then combated in the court system. And ultimately the court system in January of 2020 ruled for a different system. So we've now moved away from the 11 regions and have moved to this um, system. And so I'll explain this to you. So in the rightmost panel, you see that you have a patient whose status 1A or 1B. These are essentially our acute liver failure patients that need a liver immediately or they'll die within seven days is the uh, criteria there. So you have a donor hospital and, and their hospitals A, B, and C within a 500 nautical mile region of the donor hospital. And this is determined by distance alone. So if hospital A has a status 1A patient, then this is the hospital that gets that liver. If they don't, then you go to hospital C. If they don't, then you go to hospital B. And you look within that area. And if there's nobody within that area, then they move on to what is panel A, where you look at the sickest chronic patients, so patients with high MELD or PELD scores. And you do the same thing. You start with a small radius, and then you get bigger and bigger. And the closest hospital with the first matching patient gets the liver. Um, and then if, if you have nobody in there, then you um, get patients who are not as sick, but still waiting in line to get a liver. And so you go out by these concentric circles, um, and now the system has essentially become a distance. Um, I know we won't talk a lot, about, a lot about pediatrics, but remember that adults can accept pediatric livers, but um, if there's a pediatric donor, 
um, than the list that liver typically goes to a pediatric recipient as well before they'll consider giving it to an adult. Okay. So having said that, let's talk about our objectives and just um, quickly recap here. So we talked about um, acute liver failure today. Um, if a patient presents with any encephalopathy, an INR of greater than 1.5, an acute illness with no underlying liver disease, then they meet the criteria for liver failure. Everything else is a liver injury. Then we um, went through how to identify a cause of liver injury. Um, typically, we go through this um, methodical way to look at things instead of just ordering all the tests on day one because it's way more likely that a patient um, who is homeless and has recent diarrhea has an acute hepatitis rather than Wilson disease, right? So just be more methodical. And then we talked um, very briefly about this you know, distribution of organs. Previously, it was divided by the 11 regions. Now we have a newer system um, since 2020. Um, remember, sicker patients first, so acute liver failure trumps the sickest patient with cirrhosis. Um, and still there are large disparities that remain with this organ distribution system. And so there's ongoing work um, and discussing the ethics of fairness of liver transplants. Okay, and with that, um, we'll take any questions. And then I just have a short four question survey for you guys to fill out about this presentation and what you'd like to see in the future. So thank you for sharing your time and mental effort with me this afternoon. Jacob says, in acute liver failure, is the pattern of hyperbilirubinemia usually predominantly direct or is it sometimes indirect too? Um, yeah, you know, it's it can vary. Um, it is usually direct though, unless the patient is having, um, it sort of goes from direct to indirect as your liver starts to fail more, but it can be any pattern. I would just say if there is any level of indirect hyperbilirubinemia, then also think about um, hemolysis with it. Because it's not uncommon, you know, for a patient like with Wilson disease to have um, Coombs negative hemolytic anemia, but also when patients are this sick, they can very easily have concomitant DIC, and you should be thinking about that as a cause of indirect hyperbilirubinemia as well. But it can it can vary depending on what the function of your liver. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, everybody.